consider a reheated Rankine cycle using steam as the working fluid. Steam leaves the boiler and enters the turbine at 4 MPa and 400 degrees Celsius and is expanded in the low-pressure turbine stages to 10 kPa. An engineer is considering adding a 400 kPa reheat stage to this facility, which would bring the steam back up to 400 degrees Celsius before expanding again. I want us to determine the thermal efficiency of this facility both with the reheat stage added and without the reheat stage. And essentially what we're doing here is an analysis of two different Rankine cycles. In one of them we have a simple Rankine cycle wherein we are compressing first in the pump from 10 kPa to the high pressure of 4 MPa, then we enter the boiler bringing the temperature up to 400 degrees Celsius again. So note states 1, 2, and 3 are going to be the same across the two. The difference is now we enter a high pressure turbine, expand from 4 MPa down to 400 kPa before going into the boiler again, increasing the temperature back up to 400 degrees Celsius before expanding from 400 kPa down to 10 kPa. That means that we have a couple of additional state points and the state point at the entrance to the condenser is going to be different. Let's set up two different system diagrams and identify the four state points associated with the simple version that is without the reheat stage and the six state points that are relevant to the reheat variation of this problem. So in the simple version of this problem, the non-reheat version of our Rankine cycle, we only have two pressures. The high pressure, which is 4 MPa, I believe, yep, 4 MPa, and the low pressure, which is 10 kPa. I know that states 1 and 4 are at the low pressure, and states 2 and 3 are at the high pressure. In the reheat version of this problem, I have a low pressure of 10 kPa at states 6 and 1, a high pressure of 4 MPa at states 2 and 3, and then an intermediate pressure or medium pressure at states 4 and 5, and that's the reheat pressure, which is 400 kPa. So those pressures give me half of my required independent intensive properties. For the rest of them, I have to consider what I assume about the phases and what I assume about the operation of the devices. I assume that the pump and turbines operate isentropically because I wasn't given enough information to deduce otherwise, which means that I can say S2 in the non-reheat version is equal to S1 and S4 is equal to S3. And then... In the reheat version, I can say S2 is equal to S1, S4 is equal to S3, and S6 is equal to S5. Then I assume that the entrance to my pump is a saturated liquid. I assume that because the condenser is only condensing. The condenser is not supercooling, it's not compressing the substance, it's just a chamber with a hole in the bottom where water condenses and then leaves. So X1 in both cases is assumed to be zero. And I will add that that is an assumption we make unless we are given enough information to deduce otherwise. If you were told something about the operation of your pump, like it is super cooled by 20 degrees Celsius, or it is in the compressed liquid region by this amount, that would indicate your condition at state one. Since we don't know anything like that, we assume that it's just a saturated liquid. Then our final independent intensive property comes from the fact that we were told the entrance to the turbine is 400 degrees Celsius, meaning T3 and T3 are both 400 degrees Celsius.
And then I was told that the reheat stage brings the temperature back up to 400 degrees Celsius, which means T5 is also 400 degrees Celsius. So I have enough independent intensive properties identified so as to be able to look up whatever I need. At state 1, I'm going to want H1 and S1. Using S1 to look up H2, then using T3 and P3, I can look up H3, and I can use S3 to look up H4. Also note, because I have a pump, I can make the assumption that I have an incompressible fluid across the pump and you look up V1 and then use the shortcut to get to H2 instead of using entropy. On the reheat iteration, I have the same values as earlier for states 1, 2, and 3. Meaning that I can actually just pull those over once I've looked them up for part A. At state 4, we begin to diverge. We have a different value because we have a different pressure. State 5, we can look up H5 and S5, and then use that entropy for H6. For my property lookups, I'm going to be using the steam tables in the back of the Wiley textbook. I would encourage you to consider pausing the video now and trying these lookups on your own as practice, and then unpausing and watching me go through it to verify that you got the same results. So now's your chance to pause. Three, two, one. Hey, you're back. How did it go? How did that triple interpolation go? Did you enjoy it? How about that pentuple interpolation? I bet that went well. Did you struggle at all with the interpolation values for the S3 and S5 values that you had in part B? I hope not. I hope it all went well. Just to double check that we're all on the same page, let's walk through this together, shall we? At state one, we are looking for H1 and S1. That's a saturated liquid at the low pressure, which is 0.1 bar, 10 kilopascals, which is 0.1 bar. For that, I'm going to jump into our saturated liquid tables by pressure. I'm going to find 0.1 bar, and I'm going to read off HF and SF. Those values are 191.83 and 0.6493, respectively. So 191.83 is our H1. And that was kilojoules per kilogram. And S1 was 0.6493. Stay one done. Next up is state two, wherein I had an entropy of 0 0.6493 and a pressure that is the high pressure, which is four megapascals, which is 40 bar. The first thing to do at state two is to fix the phase. So that would be done by going into our saturation tables by pressure, finding 40 bar, and then comparing our S value to SF and SG. I should have a compressed liquid because I'm going up from the saturated liquid line, but just to double check here, I see. 40 bar has an SF and SG value of 2.7964 and 6.0701 respectively. My S2 is less than SF, which means that I have a compressed liquid. So jumping over to my compressed liquid tables, I can scan down until I find 40 bar and I see, oh no, I don't happen to have a 40 bar subtable. So what that means is I'm going to be interpolating between the 25 bar and 50 bar subtables. And since my entropy value doesn't happen to perfectly correspond to either of these two rows, let's see here, I can highlight those to make it easier to follow, perhaps. Because my interpolation doesn't lie directly on one of the two rows, I have to interpolate between two rows and between two tables at the same time. So I'm doing a triple interpolation for both entropy and enthalpy. And it's the last interpolation that unites the two. So I do two intermediate stepping stone lookups for enthalpy, two intermediate stepping stone lookups for entropy, and then the final entropy that I have gets us to what we actually want for enthalpy. So it's more of a pentuple lookup, a pentuple interpolation, if you will. And to help visualize this, I can draw a pressure subtable that's representing what we're doing. We are building a table of temperature enthalpy, and entropy values. And I'm going to make this a better table. Here, let's just go overboard here with this temporary table, shall we? Straight line. Boom. <laughs> they weren't even long enough. Great. Third time's the charm. Okay. Temperature column. Done. 
Enthalpy column, done. Enthalpy column, done. So I want to look up an enthalpy value at 40 degrees Celsius and 40 bar, and an entropy value at 40 degrees Celsius and 40 bar, and then 80 degrees Celsius and 40 bar, again, for both enthalpy and entropy. So I'm essentially doing this lookup, then this lookup, then this lookup, and then this lookup, and then I'm using my entropy to get us to this value. So four intermediate lookups before the actual interpolation that gets me to H2. For this, I'm going to need our calculator. And I will start with 40 degrees Celsius and 40 bar for enthalpy, and then 80 degrees Celsius and 40 bar for enthalpy, and then 40 degrees Celsius and 40 bar for entropy, and then 80 degrees Celsius and 40 bar for entropy. So I wake up the calculator, jump back into our compressed liquid tables. What I'm doing first is interpolating for 40 degrees Celsius and 40 bar for enthalpy. So 40 minus 25 divided by 50 minus 25, and that is equal to the value that I want, minus the value at 40 degrees Celsius and 25 bar, which is 169.77, divided by the value at 50 bar and 40 degrees Celsius, which is 171.97, minus 169.77, and I'm looking for x. Furthermore, since I'm doing this like a million times in a row, I'm going to plug these in symbolically to help me iterate a little bit faster. So first lookup is at an A value of 169.77 and a B value of, let's say B, there we go. And a B value of 171.97, giving me an enthalpy value of 171.09. And then next I'm interpolating for 80 degrees Celsius and 40 bar, so 338.85. And 336.86, and then next entropy value at 40 degrees Celsius, which is going to be 171.97 and 169.77, and then entropy at 80 degrees Celsius, 338.85, and no. Whoa, what was I doing? I just did enthalpy again. Well, let's try that again. And then entropy value at 40 degrees Celsius, which is 0 0.5705 and 0 0.5715. And then entropy value at 80 degrees Celsius, which is 1.0720 and 1.0737. So my four stepping stone values are respectively 171.09338.054, 0 0.5709, and 1.07268. So again, just to show what I'm doing visually here, I can actually populate those values. So I had 171.09, 171.09, 171.09, 171.09. Zero five four, and then zero point five seven zero nine, and one point zero seven two six eight, and then I'm using my entropy value, which is zero point six four nine three, to get to our enthalpy value here. So our final interpolation, this one for all the potatoes, is 0 0.6493 minus 0 0.5709 divided by 1.07268 minus 0 0.5709, and that is equal to x minus 171.09 divided by 338.054 minus 171.09, and I get a value of 197.177, which I don't even need to write in the table because I'm writing it up here. 197.177 kilojoules per kilogram and thank you intermediate table you have done your duty now be gone because i need the space that's our enthalpy 2 done again you could have used the shortcut you could have looked up v1 and then used the incompressible pump work equation which is the specific work of the pump which is equal to h2 minus h1 is approximately equal to v1 times p2 minus p1 could have used that equation to approximate h2 but since we're here to do property lookups let's just do them as accurately as possible now i have t3 400 degrees celsius and the high pressure which was again 
4 megapascals, which is 40 bar. First question here is, what is the phase at state 3? For that, I will go into our saturation tables by pressure. I will find 40 bar, and I will look at, excuse me, the saturation temperature, which is 250.4. I see that my temperature, which is 400 degrees Celsius, is higher than the saturation temperature at 40 bar, which means that I must have a superheated vapor. So I go into my superheated water vapor tables, and I scan until I find the 40 bar table. And look at that. We actually have a 40 bar subtable. I almost forgot that could happen. That's convenient. Therefore, my H3 and S3 values are going to be 3213.6 and 6.769, respectively. 3213.6, 3213.6, 3213.6 kilojoules per kilogram. And S3, which is equal to 6.769, 6.769. Kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And then for H4, we're going to use our entropy, which is again 6.769, and we're going to compare that to SF and SG at our low pressure to determine if we have a compressed liquid, a superheated vapor, or something in between. So I'm going to go back to my pressure subtables and find 0.1 bar. Zoom in entirely too much. And then I see that my SF at 0.1 bar is 0.6493 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and my SG value is 8.1502. My entropy value at state 4 is 6.769, which is between those two values, which means that I have a saturated liquid vapor mixture. Therefore, my interpolation is going to look like S4 minus SF divided by SG minus SF, which, by the way, is among our definitions for the quality at state 4, is equal to H4 minus HF divided by HG minus HF. And I could look up the quality here as well if I wanted to, but I don't need it to be able to continue, so I won't. I'm just going to jump from entropy all the way to enthalpy. So my interpolation is going to go, come on calculator, that entropy at state 4, which is equal to state 3, is 6.769. Hold on. Let's establish the frame of our interpolation. 6.769 minus SF at 0 0.1, which was 0 0.6493. Divided by SG, which is 8.1502, minus SF, which is 0 0.6493, is equal to, I am going to scroll over to the left, so I can figure out how to get my hand tool back. I left a comment, that's fun. Go away comment. So H, which is what I need, jump back to the calculator. Minus 191.83 divided by 2584.7 minus 191.83. And that gives me a H4, which is 2144.08. 2144.08. The only thing that my quality of state 4 would be useful for here would be. I don't know if I asked us to graph this on a TS diagram, but when have I ever asked us to do that? I mean, that's totally unlikely, right? Anyway, now that we have all four enthalpies, we can proceed to calculate the work in, the Q in, the work out, and the Q out. And I will point out here that I could just jump all the way to thermal efficiency if I wanted to, plugging in everything symbolically, but doing that would assume that you know how to build these equations. And I just want a little bit more practice at that. So character building in the meantime. And then once we have those quantities, I can calculate the thermal efficiency. So thermal efficiency is equal to net work out divided by Q in. And that's what we actually wanted. So I have a simple Rankine cycle. Go away, calculator. So work in is going to be H2 minus H1 because it's the specific work across the pump. Q in is going to be H3 minus H2, work out is going to be H3 minus H4, and Q out is going to be H4 minus H1. And then I'm going to have basically the same framework here for part B. So while these are still blank, I'm just going to copy that over. It's too much over. Sounded a little bit like radio protocol there. This is too much. Over. 
Anyway, I'm going to plug in my H1, H2, H3, and H4 values to get my work in, my Q in, my workout, and my Q out. Those are 197.177 minus 191.83, giving me a work in of 5.347, and then 3213.6 minus 197.177, which gives me a Q in of 3016.42. My work out would be 3213.6 minus 2144.08, and my Q out would be 2144.08 minus 191.83. So I have work in, Q in, work out, and Q out. 5.347 kilojoule per kilogram, and then 3016.42 kilojoules per kilogram, and then 1069.52 kilojoules per kilogram, and 1952.25 kilojoules per kilogram. Then my net workout is going to be 1069.52 minus 5.347. And I get 1064.17. And then just to double check that I built those equations correctly, I will take Q in minus Q out. And are you ready for it to be the same? Here we go. Hey, look, guys, it's the same. Hooray. 1064.17 kilojoules per kilogram. And I will remind you here that. These numbers being the same doesn't mean that your enthalpy values are correct. It just means that you built these four equations correctly. As we get to more complicated variations on the Rankine cycle, the complexity of those equations will increase. And as a result, the probability of something going wrong while you're building them will also increase. So network out 1064.17 divided by QN, which was... 3016.42 gives us a thermal efficiency of 35.3%. And with that, I can call part A done and move on to part B. Part B begins with the same three state points. Because the independent intensive properties which define states 1, 2, and 3 are the same, the H1, H2, H3 values will also be the same, so I will just copy those over. But note that because the pressure is different at state 4, our state 4s are different. So don't get too heavy-handed here. Then at state 4, we have an entropy of 6.769 and a pressure of 400 kilopascals, which would be 4 bar. So the first decision, like with state 4 earlier, is what phase do I use? And to fix our phase, we go back into our saturation tables. We find 4 bar, and then I grab my highlighter tool, and then forget that I have my highlighter tool when I go to move the page around later on, as is tradition. And then I'm going to compare my entropy value, which is 6.769, to SF and SG. I see that my S value is between the two, therefore I have a saturated liquid vapor mixture, so I'm going to use the same interpolation as earlier. I'm going to say H, H4 minus HF divided by HG minus HF is equal to S4 minus SF divided by SG minus SF. And because I don't actually care about the quality, I don't need the quality as a stepping stone, so I will just do the interpolation in one fell swoop. So I'm going to say, let's just grab HF and HG while we're here with the highlighter so that we don't accidentally misgrab that number. Switch back to the hand tool, scroll up just to make sure that that's HF and HG, and indeed it is. So our interpolation will look like 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 6.769, 
So I'm going to go into my saturation tables at four bar. I'm going to switch back to the hand tool. I'm going to see that the saturation temperature is 143.6 degrees Celsius. My temperature is greater than the saturation temperature at four bar, which means that I still have a superheated vapor. So I'm going to jump over to my superheated vapor tables and I'm going to scan until I find four bar. And unfortunately, I do not have a pressure subtable corresponding to four bar, which means that I have to interpolate. And worse yet, I have to interpolate between three bar on one page and five bar on the other. So prepare yourselves for lots of scrolling. So my interpolation is going to go four minus three divided by, and I press the wrong button, divided by five minus three, and that is equal to the thing that I'm looking for minus the value at four bar divided by the value at five bar, which is 3271.9 minus the value at four bar, solving for x. So, previous page, scrolling down, three bar, 400 degrees Celsius, enthalpy of 3275. So, 3275 and 3275. Let's just verify, 3275 for 400 degrees Celsius and three bar and 400 degrees Celsius and five bar is 3271.9. So my enthalpy at state five is going to be 3273.45. 3273.45. Three, Same process for entropy. Therefore, my entropy will be interpolated between something and 7.7938. So then jumping back to three bar, rolling on down, 400 degrees Celsius, three bar is 8.0330, right? Entropy, yep, 400 degrees Celsius, three bar, 8.0330, 8.0330, ready, here we go again, 8.0330, and I get 7.9134. kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and then H6 is going to have the same entropy, and the low pressure, which was 10 kilopascals, which is 0.1 bar, so as you are probably getting the hang of, we have to first look at SF and SG to determine the phase. At a pressure of 0.1 bar on the saturation tables by pressure, I can see that SF is 0.6493 and SG is 8.1502. My Entropy lies between the two, which means that I have a saturated liquid vapor mixture. So I'm going to take S6 minus SF divided by SG minus SF is equal to H6 minus HF divided by HG minus HF. So I am going to take my entropy. I'm going to scooch this down so I can read everything all at once. My entropy, which was 7.9134 minus 0 0.6493, and I'm going to divide by 8.1502 minus 0 0.6493, and that is equal to x minus 191.83 divided by 2584.7 minus 191.83. That gives me an enthalpy value of 2509.16. And just to sanity check, my entropy value was much closer to SG than it was to SF, which means that our enthalpy value should be much closer to HG than it is to HF. So these are all strong indications that I probably did that at least mostly correct. My biggest fault when I'm working quickly like this is make typos when I'm typing. So fingers crossed that didn't happen on any of those property lookups. Anyway, I have my six enthalpies so I can calculate our work in Q in, work out in, Q out. Work in is H2 minus H1 because it occurs in the pump. Q in is H3 minus H2 plus H5 minus H4 because Q in is going into the process from 2 to 3 and also the process from 4 to 5. So I have to account for both of those. Similarly, my workout will be H3 minus H4 plus H5 minus H6 because I have to add together the work of the two turbines. So 3 minus 4 plus 5 minus 6. And then my Q out is just a boring H6 minus H1 because the Q out is occurring in the condenser. And with those equations established, I can calculate and work in a Q in, a work out, and a Q out. 
My working is going to be the same because it's the same driving enthalpies, 5.347. And then we are taking H3 minus H2 plus H5 minus H6. I don't know why I pulled up the solve function. So 3 minus 2, which is 3213.6 minus 197.177 plus 5 minus 4, which is 3273.45 minus 2685.7, 2685.7, That gives me 3,604.17. Kilojoules per kilogram, and then three minus four plus five minus six, three two one three point six minus two six eight five point seven plus three two seven three point four five minus two five zero nine point one six, giving me one thousand two hundred ninety two point one nine. And lastly, I have 6 minus 1, which is 2,509.16 minus 191.83, giving me 2317.33. And then with those quantities established, I can take 1,292.19 minus 5.347, and I get 1,286.84. And then I compare that to 3604.317 minus 2317.33, and they should be the same. And hooray, they are the same. And I get 1286.84 and 1286.84. Those quantities are still in kilojoules per kilogram. And when I take that number divided by QN, I get 3604.17. I get a thermal efficiency of 35.7. So with that, I have finished what the problem asked me for, but you guys probably know what I wanna do, right? I wanna plot this on a TS diagram, you know, just for fun, right? Because that's how you keep your TS diagram skills sharp. So I'm going to jump to a new page. I'm going to establish some axes. Like, I'm not gonna be able to fit two on those. There we go. And then this is the Entropy axis. I want to note that with an S. And this is the temperature axis. No, with a T. And I'm going to want to plot my state points relative to the saturation lines. So I will draw some saturation lines. Do that better. And then really long in the X axis. That's kind of terrible. It should be a little bit more curvy, but that'll work for now. And then I'm going to draw some lines of constant pressure, some isobars. I'm going to do one at the low pressure. And then one at the high pressure, which I will draw as being here. And remember that in the superheated vapor region, these get more swoopy the further to the right you get. So I'm going to draw my state point one as being right here. So saturated liquid on the low pressure, and then state point two is being directly above it, which is right here. And then state three, which is at the high pressure and 400 degrees Celsius. 400 is a little bit higher than the critical point, so I will draw that like here. And then I will split between, hold on, this is four megapascals. This is 10 kilopascals. And then I will split my diagram so that I draw a separate one for A and B. So I will copy and paste this over. Hopefully it fits down here. It doesn't. Cool. So I guess I will open up another new sheet of paper. And I will paste that diagram. And then we will jump back to this one. So my state four is directly below state three, which puts it right about here. Therefore, my process 
from one to two is a vertical line, and then two to three follows this line of constant pressure, and then three to four is a vertical line again, and four back to one is a horizontal line because it's an ISO bar. Because it's a process that occurs at a constant pressure under the saturation dome. So this region enclosed is my network out. And remember that that's because it's Q in minus Q out, which is also equal to work out minus work in. And the area under the curve from two to three represents my Q in, so you can get a visual representation for the thermal efficiency by imagining this proportion divided by the entire area under two to three. Now let's compare and contrast that to what it would look like with the reheat cycle. For that, I'm going to need another line of constant pressure. And I will draw that right about here. And this is 400 kilopascals. So now state four is still directly below state three. We were really close to these saturated vapor lines, but not quite there. Still under the dome, and then we follow back up to the same temperature. Five, and then down again to state six, which is also close to the saturated vapor line, but not quite there. So my process from one to two is a vertical line, and I have a constant pressure process from two to three, and then a vertical line from three to four, constant pressure process from four back up to five, and then a vertical line from five to six, and constant pressure process from six back to one. So my network out is still the region under this curve. We've just added this region here. Does that make sense? So this entire region is still network out. And the region that I added is proportionally adding more network out than it is Q in, which means that I'm going to improve my thermal efficiency. Another way to think of that is to consider how this would look if I had three reheating stages. Let's say green for that. If I had split this across three stages, I would end up with something that looks like this. And if I split it across four stages, it would go down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And if you were to extrapolate that all the way out to infinity, if you had an infinite number of reheating stages, you essentially have a horizontal line all the way to the low pressure. Which means that you have essentially an isothermal workout process, which means as you add reheating stages, you are getting closer to the Carnot workout, if that logic makes sense. So the more reheat stages you add, the higher your thermal efficiency. But that butts up against the reality of having to build this. In reality, the addition of a reheating stage is going to add some mechanical complexity. You have to pay money for that. And at a certain point, you cross the line of diminishing returns. So adding to your thermal efficiency by incurring a cost doesn't make up for the cost if the increase in thermal efficiency is too small to actually get a return on that investment. So in reality, you see the point of diminishing of returns appearing at about two or three stages. So you might see two frequently, you might see three infrequently, but you hardly ever see four, if that logic makes sense. The next question I want to pose is, why did the engineer choose 400 kilopascals? I mean, that could be chosen arbitrarily, but at what point is it better or worse to use a higher reheating pressure or a lower reheating pressure? To answer that question, we really should consider this calculation over and over again. And for that, let's open it up in MATLAB. If you set this up in MATLAB, you get something that looks like this. Note that I'm using XSteam to perform my property lookups, and XSteam is expecting pressures in bar, which means that I'm defining my low, medium, and high pressures in bar. I also have a high temperature established, but the rest of the calculations are all the same. We look up all of our properties using the XSteam function, we take our difference in enthalpies to determine our work in, Q in, work out, and Q out, and we determine a thermal efficiency. And when I run this calculation in MATLAB, I get a thermal efficiency of 38.87%.
So that's going to be slightly more accurate than our hand calculations because Xsteam is doing a better job of interpolating than we are. We're using linear interpolation for everything. It's using an actual curve fit of the data to get better values. It's, it also has the benefit of not losing any accuracy to rounding, but a thermal efficiency of 35.87% is pretty close to what we had. And the advantage of this is that we can make changes like, what if I were to increase the reheating pressure from four bar to, I don't know, eight bar? Is that going to increase or decrease my thermal efficiency? Well, we can see it increases. We're now at 36.3. And if I were to increase that from 8, say, to 16, we dropped it a little bit. So the function of how the reheat pressure affects thermal efficiency is a little bit more complicated than just it always increases it by increasing the pressure or it always decreases it by decreasing the pressure. So to get a better idea of what the ideal reheat pressure is that would optimize the thermal efficiency, we should consider all of the possible reheat pressures between the lower bound, which would be equal to the low pressure, and the upper bound, which would be equal to the higher pressure. MATLAB can do that all relatively quickly. So I'm just setting this all inside of a loop. I'm having it iterate through all of the possible reheat pressures, starting at the low pressure and ending at the high pressure. And what we get is a relationship that looks like this. So we can see that increasing the reheat pressure improves the thermal efficiency up until around 12 bar, maybe. And then at that point, increasing the reheat pressure decreases the thermal efficiency. So generally speaking, a higher reheat pressure is better overall, but we can optimize the thermal efficiency by shooting for a reheat pressure of maybe 11 or 12. And MATLAB can actually spit out that maximum value, the maximum thermal efficiency, and the reheat pressure corresponding to it if we wanted it to. That's the advantage of having the calculations done in a computer as opposed to completing them by hand. But don't get too comfortable with completing them electronically because I still expect you to be able to handle the calculations by hand because when you take the FE, you're going to be expected to look up the properties and compute some calculations with a hand calculator and a set of tables. And with that, I think we can consider this problem done.